this week we're going to talk about the equity premium and the link between macroeconomics and finance. Um, let's start with the equity premium. Our big goal is to understand uh, these patterns that we've seen in expected returns and their links to the macroeconomy. We need the economics of, uh, of these interesting facts that we've looked at. So the natural framework is, is the equation we've been working on for, for so long. Uh, one equals uh, discounted expected consumption growth. And the problem is, as you've seen in the readings, it doesn't work very well. Now, I would say yet. Uh, I think we actually can, can work on this and get this to work better. But nonetheless, in, in, in its first outings, it, it wasn't a huge success. Now, the equity premium puzzle is a set of calculations that, that diagnosed what really went wrong and help us uh, find better models that, that are going to work better than this one. Um, so let's, let, let's start with the basic calculation. I've done here the, uh, the standard first order condition in, in continuous time and then the approximation in discrete time. Uh, divide both sides, uh, express the covariance as the product of standard deviation and correlation coefficient. Divide both sides by standard deviation. And we get that the market sharp ratio should be related to uh, risk aversion, variance of consumption growth, and the correlation. Now, let's get even more robust. <clears throat> that correlation is sensitive to timing. If I move the, the data series just a little bit right to left, I destroy correlations. So for an even more robust uh, a prediction of this model, uh, what if the correlation is, is 1? Correlations can't be bigger than 1. Well, that means that the market sharp ratio has to be less than risk aversion times the standard deviation of consumption growth. That's a very simple, very robust prediction of this model. Let's go see how it looks in the data. And the equity premium puzzle is the statement that this doesn't work that well in the data. Look at these round numbers. Uh, expected consumption growth is about 2%. Standard deviation about 2%. I'll use 8 and 16% for the mean and standard deviation of the market uh, portfolio return. And the correlation, the best I can get is about 0.4 in annual data. It's lower in other data. So can, can we use, can we even fit these basic numbers in, into our theory? That's, that's the issue. Well, market sharp ratio, 8 over 16, that's 0.5. So uh, see if that number, sigma of delta C, is 0.02, 2%, that means we need a risk aversion of 25. 25 is a lot of risk aversion. And it gets worse when you recognize, in fact, that correlations are less than 1. Correlation is about 0.5, at least, at least less than 0.5. <clears throat> that means that the market sharp ratio of 0.5, the 2% standard deviation of consumption growth, uh, that needs a risk aversion coefficient of 50. Now, risk aversion coefficients of 50, people who are that risk averse don't go out, they don't get out of bed in the morning because they're worried about anvils falling from the sky. Uh, that seems like a much too high a number. Uh, well, you could go on and say, well, science is science. Risk aversion is 50, let's use 50 for risk aversion. Uh, but then we run into trouble on the other simple predictions of the model. So the risk-free rate puzzle, let's take risk aversion 50 and, and see if we can fit the next obvious thing we need to fit, which is the level and relative constancy of the risk-free rate. So I wrote down here the risk-free rate equation that we started with uh, weeks and weeks ago. Discount factor, gamma times expected consumption growth, and then the precautionary uh, savings term. Uh, so here's our round numbers, maybe 2% for the uh, real risk-free rate, 2% uh, for expected consumption growth, and roughly 2% for the uh, variance of consumption growth. That first term represents intertemporal substitution. Uh, how, how interest rates induce people to, to save and, and consume later rather than today. And you can see that that would lead us into deep trouble. If we accept a risk aversion coefficient of 50, multiplying it by 2% consumption growth, uh, well, 2% times 50 is, is a big number, and the risk free rate itself is only 2%. We would have to imagine a delta of 90, <laughs> negative 98%. People prefer the future to the present by, by a 98% discount factor. Now, that seems silly, but, but maybe precautionary savings can help us. In fact, with these huge risk aversion coefficients, normally those are small numbers and we ignore them. But huge risk aversion coefficients uh, mean that this precautionary savings effect, that, that when people feel risk a lot, they want to save more, maybe that can help us. And it's true, with big gamma, it almost looks like we have a success. We're looking for 2% on the left-hand side, gamma times 2% on that term, gamma, gamma plus 1 times 2% squared, but there's gamma squared, so if these numbers are about the same, it works. And that says, hey, maybe gamma 99 is the answer. Well, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, that won't work either. 
I'll call it the sensitivity puzzle, if we did accept gamma of 99, huge risk aversion, then a tiny change in the expected uh, consumption growth should re re result in a huge change in interest rates. If expected consumption growth goes up one-tenth of a percent, then the interest rate goes up 99 times that much. We just don't see that. We see variations in expected consumption growth that aren't associated with huge variation in interest rate, variations in the variance of consumption growth that isn't uh, associated with huge variations uh, in the interest rate. So we're kind of stuck. This huge risk aversion doesn't, didn't seem to make economic uh, sense. And even accepting huge risk aversion, you can't really fit these most fundamental predictions of the model. That's the, the equity premium puzzle. There's more puzzles, too. The time-varying equity premium puzzle. Uh, we saw the dividend yields forecast returns. Well, our basic equation would tell us that, therefore, the conditional Sharpe ratio should vary over time. And that should be related to the uh, uh, time-varying risk aversion, time-varying standard deviation of consumption growth, or correlation. A time-varying Sharpe ratio needs a time-varying volatility of the discount factor, conditionally heteroscedastic discount factor. We need to understand why everyone gets scared in recessions. Are they more risk-averse, or is there more volatility? Why do they reach for yield in good times? These are quantitative puzzles. These aren't puzzles of, of, of literature. The signs are all right. The, the, um, the, the correlation of consumption with stock returns is positive. It's about the numbers. And as you can see, though, it, it's big in the numbers. Quibbling about the numbers and the data isn't going to get you very far. We have pervasively in asset markets high sharp ratios. E over sigma on the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.5, big numbers in, in lots and lots of different markets. We have pervasively that, that consumption growth is, is very smooth. The key observation is this, this consumption growth is not 20% like stock returns. It's about 2%. So our economy just doesn't look as risky as stock market premiums make it look. That's the central puzzle.